Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. It's 2023, January 4th. And this is the Hyperledger Foundation Healthcare Special Interest Group uh, General Meeting. So today's the 4th. And uh, what we do in this meeting typically is, one, first of all, it is recorded, so this will be on YouTube. So anything, if you do want to share anything, will be shared publicly. So just be aware of that. You can view the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy um, on this agenda page, which you can click into. This is a public page. Um, and yeah, other than that, I just wanted to quickly say or ask the community if they have any announcements they want to share before we kind of jump into some of the upcoming events and news and articles that I found over the last couple of weeks. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, there's a few folks here. Thanks for joining. So I'm not going to talk too much about the upcoming events because there are a bunch here, but just so you're not, you're aware, there is consumer electronics show happening now. Um, and there's a digital health summit going on as well. So actually that's starting tomorrow, I think. So if you're there, very curious how that's going, please share uh, in the comments or, or wherever. Um, and yeah, there's a bunch of other events, Innovator MD Global Summit 2023, the World Crypto Conference in Zurich, January 13th through the 15th, DSI London, which will be an interesting event about decentralized science. Uh, this will be January 15th through the 16th, European Blockchain Convention 2023 in Barcelona, Spain will be held February 15th through the 17th. Paris Blockchain Week will be uh, March 20 to the 24th. Vive 2023 in Nashville will be on March 26 to the 29th. HIMS April 17th to the 21st. Consensus 2023, which is a major blockchain event hosted by Coindesk, is going to be in Austin, and that'll be April 26 to the 28th. And then Bitcoin 2023 will be in Miami May 18th to the 20th. And then finally, in September, which is a long way away, but uh, this is a really, I think, important one for this community, which is the Conv2x Global Blockchain in Healthcare 2023 in New Orleans. So you can access those uh, events and feel free to ask questions to the community if you're curious, or you can buy tickets right away. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about them as well, as to the best of my ability too. So remember, this is a community here. So I think your involvement, your comments, uh, your questions and feedback is really important. And being that this is a very novel space, blockchain and healthcare, I'm sure everyone has questions. So I really encourage that communication across. All right. Well, I did find a few different articles in the last couple of weeks that I thought were worth noting. Uh, the first one is from Second Opinion. It's 2023 predictions from healthcare tech experts. So Christina Farr is a major digital health tech investor, and she's a reporter as well, um, has been in the industry for quite some time. So I was able to read through some of this, and it was interesting to see some of the expert opinions or predictions that were going to happen or that are expected to happen this year. Uh, so the first one is employers will face rising costs. This is really not that surprising, I think. Um, it says here, some of that will be tolerable, but there were there could be some surprises in 2023. Um, we should expect to see pruning of digital health vendors, particularly those that aren't performing. So similar to the crypto space, you have this consolidation of many small companies and some of them going bankrupt, some of them merging with other companies. So I think that's similar to what we're going to see with healthcare, mainly due to like inflation and just market slowdown. Hospitals are shifting away from value-based pricing. It's kind of a surprising prediction because I think that there is this push towards uh, value-based services. So the claim from Barzad Mostashari, the founder of Aladad. Uh, so this person is saying that we're going to see fee-for-service coming back 
And for hospitals, it's because of financial pressures. And that does sort of make sense because there are many hospitals struggling now to just survive, I think, um, because of the issues, many issues that they're facing with inflation and other things. Here it says hospitals accumulated primary care practices and dabbled in value-based payment models in recent years. As financial pressures mount, many of them will double down on their core fee-for-service hospital business model and shed both their primary care practices and value-based payments. Does anyone know if this is going to violate any regulatory you know, laws? Um, I think it's still sort of in the gray area with value-based payments, but very curious to know if anyone has any opinions, feel free to comment in the YouTube. Senior living industry will collide with healthcare. So this has sort of been a prediction for a few years now. I do think that there's a trend with senior living, just the aging population in general. Um, the senior living industry will continue down a collision course with the healthcare system. Sounds scary. Specialty care's convergence with value-based care will continue to accelerate. Interesting. You know, these are opinions from various tech experts. So this is from Daniel Kaplan from Generator VC. Nikhil Krishan from Out of Pocket Health. Who will buy digital health tools? It's not who you'd expect. So here, it won't be this person saying, Nikhil saying that it won't be the same brand name hospitals. Historically, it's been Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic's major hospital chains, hospital systems in the country. Um, but here, Nikhil is saying that um, on the flip side, there seems to be an increasing appetite to partner with tech companies from lesser known hospitals, a combination of getting stretched extremely thin in operations running off the rails due to COVID and a need to figure out how to get referrals might be the reasons driving this. Um, as an example, we've seen an A16Z partner with Bassett Healthcare Network for the portfolio companies to test out solutions and carbon partnering with John Muir Health. So we'll be seeing, according to this, we'll be seeing more smaller health system partnerships with digital health companies, which I think is a good thing um, because I do think that innovation can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be at the big, big hospital. So this makes sense to me. Um, I don't think I saw any predictions on blockchain mm -hmm. though. That's the, the one thing I wanted to mention or the decentralization yeah that's one thing i noticed that this doesn't have any predictions on blockchain a little disappointing for me but uh this is what it is um here how bad will it get for tech backed insurance it's gonna get worse according to them late stage capital raises we'll see more discipline i agree <laughs> there's been a lot of investing lately the last few years so i think now it's going to cool off a little bit greater transparency is coming in pharmacy I hope so. Startups will sell at steep discounts. Yeah, probably. Uh, virtual care will continue to grow, but hybrid models will be most successful. Okay. Uh, biosecurity will become more of a thing. I agree. I think bio, I guess, what do they mean by biosecurity? As programmable biology becomes cheaper, faster, and more efficient, New companies focused on biosecurity will emerge. This is from Morgan Cheatman from Best Emmer Venture Partners. VCs will start to seek out these opportunities. So it seems to be that there's like a going to be a trend for securing um, data. Let's see what kind of data they're referring to because biosecurity is sort of unclear to me. We can now program biology to explore new chemical and biological space that is not found in nature. Okay, right. Uh, companies focused on biosecurity will emerge in 2023 and will require interdisciplinary founding teams to marry deep biology and chemistry domain expertise with the cybersecurity and machine learning acumen. This sounds like a really good opportunity for decentralized data management and blockchain and decentralized ledger technologies. So, and this is more about the data that's emerging from uh, machine learning chemistry and biology, less about patient clinical data. So that's just an interesting thing to note. 
Uh, and I think the last one here, anything non-mission critical will struggle to sell. Keep that in mind, people. All right. Um, so that was that. Anyone have any thoughts or opinions on this one? Cool. All right. Next here is how open standards support enhanced distribution security. So this was a... I'm not going to go through all of this, but it was interesting to see how much content was shared. This is from uh, George Jurgis and um, talks a lot about the DSCSA, which is the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. A lot of people are pushing blockchain technologies in order to make this um, regulation more attainable or doable, technologically speaking. So uh, it's interesting to see what he speaks about here and how he's promoting open standards, which is really important. And just so everyone is aware, uh, with less than a year to go until full DSCSA enforcement on November 27th, 2023, mark your calendars, an, an industry-wide collaborative push is needed to get everyone from manufacturers all the way to dispensers uh, ready on time. So a lot of work being done in the space. There's a lot of videos here you can watch. So how do manufacturers support small uh, dispensers? So if anyone is in the supply chain healthcare space for drugs, I think this is just a really good resource that's fairly um, new, December 14th. So I think you'll get a lot of value from this. Uh, talks about um, credentials and many other things here. Uh, but specifically, I think the point is, what's the big deal about open standards and how important are they in the future for open standards and Hyperledger being an open uh, community? Uh, I think it's really important to just emphasize that open source, open access is something I think that benefits society as a whole. Uh, and I'm just glad to see that this is happening for the supply chain space and, and drugs. Um, all right, I hope that's useful. I'm gonna move on to the next article here. USA Today opinion article, and I thought this was kind of controversial. Apple Fitbit should use all that data they collect from you to protect public health. So, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of people wouldn't uh, appreciate this stance because really they don't wanna share their data or they believe that their data is private. So there's no a right for the government to take that data from them and use it. Um, also, there's a risk of that data being sort of lost and shared with many other people and not really well secured and controlled. So I think that's the other issue too. It's not just privacy issue, but it's the fact that it can get sent out into the wild and you know shared with anyone in the world potentially. Uh, the marketing for the Apple Watch says it all. A healthy leap ahead. That's how the article starts. Here's to a healthier you. Uh, so they talk about the Apple Watch here. They talk about you know mapping exercise or disease. So how do you include these factors into um, you know determining a person's health and then population's health, for example? Um, this says here Fitbit publishes reports that show, for example, communities where people exercise the most. Cell phone location data is sometimes used to map disease outbreaks. These models and their underlying data sets could prove to be a boon to those people and agencies responsible for protecting and improving all of our health. Interesting. So aggregated health data reflects community-wide factors. Uh, that reflects community-wide factors has for centuries now aided public health practitioners, allowing them to make seemingly simple improvements that nonetheless greatly impact people's lives. So, I mean, this is an interesting claim. Um, they talk about specific examples like early warning systems for suicide. I think this has been discussed as well in the veteran affairs communities. I think that's where we see a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of suicides uh, by our military people, um, especially retired people. Again, I'm glad that they mentioned privacy concerns here. There are, to be sure, many hurdles to using social 
and community data and digital health products. Some users may have privacy concerns about sharing data with, pol with uh, companies or public health agencies. Overcoming these hurdles could involve developing more open source standards for transparency about data management or ensuring that people can control when and with which agencies to share personal data. So I think if we can give people the control of when and which agency, which agencies can get this data, I think it makes sense to me. Uh, again, that wasn't the details, but it's just good to see that this is becoming more part of the public conversation now. Any thoughts on this one? All right, moving on here. So there's, I shared a predictions article and there's another article in Forbes with anti-predictions, what won't change in healthcare? And <laughs> this was kind of a fun one to read. Uh, number one, consumers won't and maybe shouldn't take control of their healthcare. Okay, a lot of things we talk about in the blockchain distributed or Web3 communities is about taking control of your own data, taking control of your own um, life and how you can do that. So this is interesting because a, the president of Amwell, who is, uh, Amwell is like a major telehealth company in the United States. I used to work for them actually. So I, I definitely know um, about them. And I think that they're doing really you know, a great job reaching lots of patients and providers. So I think what they're doing is important. Uh, however, I, I don't know if I agree with this statement that consumers don't want to control or don't need to control their, their own health or health care. I think there's somewhere in between. I think, and the claim here is that, you know, health care is there to help us when we're vulnerable and health care providers are there to provide that. They are the experts. So it's this way of just pushing over responsibility to the providers and away from the individual and I think many patients are in that situation. Many people might not want to invest time to understand their health data or data at all. And I think this, you know, is reflected by uh, Roy here. And yeah, it's just interesting to see. I, I think there's some in-between zone where there's a trend where people, I think, will want to own their own data, but we're not there yet. So I just to make a point here, the chief legal and digital health officer at Bassett Health Care Network says people seem to care less about control of their data and more about getting the right data to the right place at the right time without them having to worry about it. And if you're putting, you know, hair health data on the blockchain, you probably have to worry about it. It's kind of not an easy user experience. So I think the user experience is what will bridge the gap between uh, wanting to own your data and not wanting to own it. Uh, moving on, 2023 will be a big year for big tech in healthcare. Um, we'll talk about here, you know, in 2023, we'll see a continuation of this failure to launch across big tech because of lack of specialized insider knowledge involving the many facets of healthcare delivery. It's from the CEO of Point Click Care. Um, very interesting. Yeah. And I think we've, we've kind of realized that it's hard for big tech to get healthcare right. We've seen it with Google, Amazon. There's a lot of examples. Um, they keep trying, and I think that's a good thing. I think they should keep trying because it's an important space. But um, yeah, digital health does not rebound very quickly anyway. It may feel boring. Okay. I won't disagree with that. Things will be tough in the first half of 2023, at least. It may feel boring. <laughs> uh, interesting. Value-based care doesn't take center stage. And we've seen with the previous examples, uh, that's also what they were claiming too. There will be no retreat from virtual care and telehealth. Yeah, agreed there. Here's an example, regardless, um, with United Health Group, which is the largest health insurance plan, health insurance company, in the United States, recently reporting that 30% of new members seeking virtual first care plans. That seems that telehealth and virtual care is here to stay. Not too surprised there, but that's good that the industry is recognizing this. 
smaller health systems won't recover quickly. Agreed. Um, and we'll see what happens, but it's a trend. Washington won't solve all our problems. <laughs> People are waiting for major federal policy, but nothing happens in 2023. Speculates Don Trigg, CEO of Apri Health, formerly Vera Health and Castlight Health. Oh. Uh, so that's interesting. Larry Ellison isn't going to achieve a unified patient record, but hopefully contributes to an industry solution. So if you didn't know, Larry Ellison, founder of Oracle, recently acquired Cerner, which is a major, the second largest electronic health record vendor, uh, bought them last year and claimed to have a solution for a unified patient record system. Um, this prediction is saying that that's not going to happen, at least not in 2023. Good luck, Larry. We're rooting for you. Um, so grit, passion, resilience, and hard work to innovate doesn't go away. So I believe this is this is true. And I think that we're going to continue seeing a lot of grit, passion, and resilience from the healthcare community and industry because that's why we're doing it. I don't think anyone does healthcare because it's easy. I think they do it because it's important. And this article or this prediction agrees with that. So those are the anti-predictions predictions, predictions uh, from Forbes. Next, we have, I thought, an interesting article about IP NFTs in great detail from Tyler Golato and Vincent Weiser. This was published a couple of weeks ago, December 21st. And it talks about the future of research with IP NFTs. So for those that may not know this, IP NFTs, stand for intellectual property, non-fungible tokens. And they talk about how IP NFTs and decentralization can enable this autonomous science or decentralized science approach. Uh, here you can see IP NFTs upgrade legacy intellectual systems by unifying IP, so patents and legal um, documents, underlying data through decentralized storage and access control and economics related to royalties and license fees and sales into one programmable transactable digital unit. Great. That's awesome. I think this is the future when we get there and when the majority of healthcare or scientists, let's say are, you know, starting to use this, I think it'll take some time, but it's certainly going to be faster than we expect. Uh, this is just the nature of exponential technology. And I think it's it's quite interesting to see you know, this level of detail because it only helps the community understand in more detail what is possible and what is being built today. Uh, so they talk through how an example of this could work. So they talk about the funders, patients, communities, as well as researchers, biotech and pharmaceutical companies, funders and patients and their roles involved here. So I think it's just interesting to, to be aware of this, especially if you're in the space. Um, if you don't know this stuff, I think it's worth your while to, to digest. Um, just to kind of, let's, you know, just give some more details here. I just want to share their vision is to enable open decentralized science using building blocks. And these building blocks are an on-chain research execution layer, on-chain verifiable scientific data and research execution, enabling machine learning computation over encrypted data. This is a key one, which is has been difficult historically, but really important if you can do it, make it work. Novel decentralized researcher identity and reputation, I'd say more of a lower hanging fruit potentially. Uh, trusted IP licensing networks to revolutionize patent quality verification, enabling IP commons, enable novel mechanisms for funding, collaboration, and community participation, explore novel price discovery mechanisms. This is really interesting, I think. Uh, and then ultimately enabling a global patent settlement and arbitration layer and an alternative open and decentralized scientific system for researchers and broad public to participate in. Great vision. Um, I'm definitely following them to see how that, that works out. Okay, 
Uh, next here was a, an opinion article I thought was interesting about medical tourism and Bitcoin and using Bitcoin and I presume other crypto currencies, but specifically here, Bitcoin, in order to reduce the friction with medical tourism. So one issue with medical tourism is that you have to exchange currencies abroad. Um, and then, you know, there are other things involved with that as well. But um, what they're saying here is, wouldn't it be nice if we can use Bitcoin or providers can accept Bitcoin in order to um, pay for services? So what's interesting here is medical tourism often occurs in less economically developed countries, right? Uh, people travel to countries where services or surgeries are cheaper. Makes sense. Bitcoin can help these nations close the wealth inequality gap by encouraging a fair, free-flowing exchange of funds in return for legitimate healthcare services. Um, currently, the top 10 countries for Bitcoin adoption include Brazil, India, and Pakistan. Many of these countries are popular, popular destinations for medical tourism. And India is a particularly popular destination for medical tourism in Asia. Um, India also scores highly in Bitcoin adoption and is ranked first in centralized service value received and retail centralized service value received. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is just, I thought it interesting. Who knows when we'll be able to pay with Bitcoin for our medical services here in the United States, but in other countries, it might happen fa faster. So again, very curious about your thoughts on this. Feel free to leave comments below under the video. All right. Next and last here in the news section is a post that I actually had the opportunity of co-publishing with Vibe Bio. And we talk about the trillion dollar biotech industry and how it can be disrupted with patient communities and how patient communities can begin to start funding or participate in the funding of early research. Um, and we specifically focused on rare disease in this article. And just a note here, there's over 10,000 rare diseases that have been cataloged and that number keeps growing as the diagnostics for detecting those diseases are improved. Um, you might be surprised to learn that considering that one in 10 Americans actually suffer from rare disease, and fewer than 10% of these conditions have FDA approved treatment. So 90% of these diseases don't have an approved treatment. This means that there are a lot of people suffering that can potentially want to help accelerate research, especially early research uh, in this space. So we, we talk about the role of patient communities and decentralization more broadly. Um, we talk about patient advocacy organizations and how they're starting to exert more influence on health policy specifically, uh, which determines the urgency of research development. So very, very important, I think, to be aware of the rare disease space because it is sort of unique in the way that um, communities are important for, for them to really get traction with, with commercialization of products. So... Yeah, I think this is, you know, really enjoyed writing this with Vibe Bio, and I hope you guys are able to check it out. All right, a couple of educational nuggets I found. One was a response to Chat GPT three. This was published in the Analytics India magazine, uh, and basically they're talking about how there's new tools and services, um, chatbot services for healthcare. And specifically the one that Google introduced called, um, I think it's called here MedPom or it's called Multimed QA, a newly introduced open source medical question answering benchmark. It combines health search QA, a new free response data set, data set of medical questions saw online with six existing open question answering data sets covering professional medical exams, research, and consumer queries. So they go into detail about how this works and where the data is coming from in more detail. Um, 
here it says these comprise the clinical topics data sets, MedQA, MedCQA, PubMedQA, LiveQA, Medication QA, and MMLU. I'm not entirely sure what MMLU stands for, um, but I'm sure someone does. And if you do, please leave a comment in the video under the video below. Uh, in addition, a new data set cure of curated frequently searched medical inquiries called Health Search QA was added to improve multi-med QA. So I guess the point of all this is instead of you know the open AI chat tool that we might have all played around with already, um, it doesn't have the capabilities to answer really detailed medical questions. If we introduce these new data sets with chat GP3, uh, I think we can improve the results of those questions. And they have some examples here um, about questions they asked. So here they ask, how do you know if ear pain is serious? <clears throat> you can see here that you know ear pain can be a sign of several underlying conditions, including all this information, which seem to be pretty good. I think this is what a, a doctor may say. Don't quote me on this. This is not medical advice at all. <laughs> of course, I think you guys can judge for yourself. Um, you know, so I just think it's interesting that this is happening so quickly. And I think that we're going to need to be careful about trusting the data that the AI will spit out. But I think we're getting much better at detecting um, what's not true. So um, and they mentioned here, Google isn't the first tech behemoth to venture into AI-driven healthcare solutions. Microsoft is also working closely with OpenAI, with the OpenAI team to employ GPT-3 to facilitate collaboration between employees and clinicians and improve healthcare teams' efficiencies. So well, in addition to that, actually, Meta AI introduced Galactica the AI generated program that claimed it would support academic researchers by generating comprehensive literature review and wiki entries entries on any subject. However, it failed due to unre sorry, unreliable results. Excuse me. Yeah, so a lot of things happening. I think 2023 we'll see a lot more assisted chat chatbot AI systems, uh, especially in healthcare, where a lot of the work that is done is sort of education patient based. And I, I think that we can leverage AI to do some of that work for us. Although there needs to be a balance between the human touch and I think AI. Um, yeah. Any thoughts, questions on this? Okay. Uh, and then just finally, I wanted to share with you all a conversation I had with the founders, the core people, the core leaders of the DSI World Organization, which is a organization trying to raise awareness about decentralized science more broadly. Um, you can check it out on any podcast player. And yeah, that's pretty much it. It's with uh, Joshua Bate and Jelani Clark. Uh, it's about an hour long, so a lot of insights in there and talk about the, the you know experience of starting the company and what they're working on. And they'll be at the D-Side London event as well in January. So uh, with that, if there's no comments or questions, I just want to thank you all very much for watching, listening, and being part of this uh, growing community. It really is important that you know even in these down times, uh, we need to focus on what's important and to build and communicate and educate people on how decentralized ledger technologies and open source communities can really help create awesome products and grow and grow many things uh, for people. Thank you all. Do you have any questions or comments? I see a chat here. Um, yeah, I just uh, shared a, a like I guess I do some uh, like industry uh, analysis. I find that the, uh, the word example forums, uh, that does analysis is pretty nice. So maybe someday, I don't know if it should be used, if you have to use here or not, maybe you can see whether uh, those uh, areas match to the Hyperledger solution areas. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I'm, I'm looking at this article now and I'm seeing the different areas here. So explore transformation maps um, to the future of health. Click into this. Should log in to see it. Okay. Um, very interesting. I'm going to add this into the uh, agenda as well so people can get access to this link. In terms of your question, like where is Hyperledger overlapping? I think that was your question. Is that right? Yeah, basically all these uh, areas that uh, the work, uh, this, this uh, article, uh, this World this, uh, Economic Forum uh, analysis, analysis uh, which area, which um, does it have to, I mean, that can play a role, basically. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap in many areas. I don't think it's, um, you know, mutually exclusive. But I think there's many different teams and groups and communities, and I'm not aware of all of them either. So I, I won't be able to answer fully your question. Um, but I hope that if there is someone who's sort of in a particular area and would like to share with you, you know, Victor, um, if they want to reach out to me or, or anyone on the, in the community, I can try to connect you with them as well. Um, I mean, I know that there's a lot of COVID-19 efforts. I know there's been a lot of related, you know, just broadly speaking, healthcare technology and data science, digital economy, innovation. Um, a lot of these areas, artificial intelligence, economic progress, global health, for sure. So there are a lot of areas here where there's overlaps. And I think it could be cool to maybe even like have World Economic Forum um, join a meeting or discuss with us what they're thinking in terms of this, this, you know, map. I think it's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing this, by the way, again. Sorry, I didn't answer your question 100%, but I hope that was helpful. Oh, no, 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 uh, that, that, that's just, it's a big area. I'm, I'm just sharing this is some, something we can probably discuss in the future. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I, I do agree. Awesome. Okay. Um, with that, uh, is there anything else anyone wants, wants to share? Any events you have going on? I think you created, you wanted to share, talk about, get feedback on. All right. Well, thank you again. Uh, you all have a great day and great week, and we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Thank you.